Good evening and welcome to NTD UK News. I'm Stuart Lees. Our top stories tonight. Defence Secretary Ben Wallace says the UK is aiming to evacuate 6,000 from Afghanistan with no flights leaving empty. Oxford University research suggests fully vaccinated people infected with the Delta variant can carry high levels of virus just like those who are not vaccinated. And what has caused mysterious symptoms in US embassy officials in Berlin? The CIA believes Russia could be behind the syndrome affecting staff in several countries. Defence Secretary Ben Wallace says no UK planes are leaving Afghanistan empty. He hopes to get 6,000 people out, but the clock is ticking. And today's Eddie Aitken has the details. Defence Secretary Ben Wallace says no UK planes are leaving Afghanistan empty with 7 to 10 RAF flights every day. He says the UK's aim is to get at least 6,000 out. Seats are being offered to other nations in need including NATO interpreters and some Japanese. The Defence Secretary tells the BBC, the UK is starting to invest in third country hubs to process fleeing Afghans. Wallace says a British presence will stay at Kabul airport as long as US forces run it. He says he is deploying another military company to support British troops on the ground and manage the crowd. Ambassador to Afghanistan Sir Laurie Bristow and his team are processing visa applications in Kabul airport. He says they are working with the Taliban at the tactical, practical level to get people out. Um, well, we had to take decisions about you know, who stayed um, in a, you know, very, very difficult circumstances at speed um, as the, uh, the situation unraveled. It's my choice to stay here. Um, all of my staff here are volunteers and I pay tribute to them for that. Um, we're working very, very closely with, um, with our military colleagues and with others across government to get through uh, the workload to get the people uh, that we need to get out of here to safety. He says the operation needs to speed up to ensure all British nationals and eligible Afghans get out. How long have we got? Um, it really depends on other things outside our control, the security situation, the approach of the Taliban. Um, we're working on the basis of days, not weeks, so we really do have to get uh, those numbers through. Outside the airport, thousands of people are desperate to escape. The Taliban demand to see documents before allowing people to enter the airport. A woman is trying to flee with her sister and mother. She says she's a doctor. Her sister works in women's rights, and her mother just lost her teaching job. We don't have any brother, we don't have father. You know that uh, living in here is very difficult for us. We were living in Herat, and we escaped from Herat and came to Kabul city to save our life, because also my uncles worked with the Taliban, and they wanted to uh, obligate us to force marriage. A plane from Afghanistan landed at the Midlands airport on Wednesday night. Refugees and British nationals were on board. Eddie Aitken, NTD News. The evacuations continue to other countries across Europe. Western nations rushed to bring their citizens and Afghan staff out of Kabul. NTD's David English has more on this. In Afghanistan, European countries have been scrambling to airlift their citizens and some of their Afghan staff from the capital's airport. A Western security official said about 8,000 people have been flown out since Sunday. The European Union's foreign policy chief said on Thursday about 100 EU staff and 400 Afghans working with the EU and their families had been evacuated. These people have loyally promoted and defended European Union interests and values in Afghanistan over many years. It's our moral duty to protect them and to help to save as many people as possible. He said more than 300 Afghans were still trying to leave and that it would not be possible to get them all out. Spain offered on Tuesday to create a hub for the evacuees to the EU. On Thursday, a European External Action Service plane carrying five Afghan families who worked with the EU, arrived in Spain's Torreón de Ardoz airport. Additionally, Spain plans to lift around 500 people from Kabul, including Spanish embassy staff and Afghans who worked with them and their families. 
Germany announced on Thursday it had evacuated 901 people from Kabul since Sunday. The government approved a mission of 600 German soldiers to assist with the evacuation. Germany's defence minister said the mission was due to continue until the 31st of August. A German general on Thursday described the challenges at Kabul airport. There is so much tension outside. The mass of people desperately wants to get into the inner area of the airport, which isn't possible as things stand, as they can't get through. So the people need to be channeled, and that is the shots you are hearing. And mixing in the outer area are Afghan forces, the Taliban, who are patrolling. A NATO and a Taliban official said 12 people have been killed in and around the airport since Sunday. The deaths were caused either by gunshots or by stampedes. Several flights from Kabul are expected at Rome's airport on Thursday, carrying some 400 Afghans. Afghans who arrive need to quarantine for COVID-19 at a base outside of Rome. Poland has airlifted around 50 people from Afghanistan. The country said it had around 100 people on an evacuation list. Over 200 people evacuated from Kabul arrived in Paris on Wednesday. It's the third French evacuation flight carrying French and Afghan nationals. David English, NTD News. An inquest today heard the Plymouth gunman had an argument with his mother before shooting her, then killing four others in the street. 22-year-old Jake Davidson turned the gun on himself after the 12-minute massacre last Thursday. The coroner said Davidson shot his 51-year-old mother, Maxine, before killing a three-year-old girl and her father. Then he killed a man and a woman and injured two others. Police aren't looking for anyone else in connection with the deaths. Five heart-shaped fireworks were launched during the British Firework Championships in Plymouth on Wednesday to pay tribute to the victims. To new research now would suggest that fully vaccinated people infected with the Indian or Delta variant are just as infectious as those who are not jabbed. NGD's John Robson brings us more. A study finds levels of the virus in people who are fully vaccinated but infected with the Delta or Indian variants could be as high as those who are not jabbed. That means vaccinated people can transmit the same amount of virus when they cough or sneeze. Scientists from the University of Oxford who conducted the research say vaccination does not eliminate the chances of getting infected, but it does reduce the risk. They compared the effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine with the AstraZeneca jab. The Pfizer vaccine appears to have greater effectiveness against the Delta variant initially, but its effectiveness also declines faster. After four to five months, the level of protection from both jabs is similar. The study looked at more than 700,000 swab test results and has not been peer-reviewed. Joanne Robson, NTD News. A look at hybrid working now. While Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland still recommend people work from home, the UK government is encouraging a gradual return to the office. NTD's Neil Rodray talks with consultant David Ellis about the current hybrid working situation. Consultant David Ellis advises companies on their plans for workers returning to the office. I spoke with him to find out more. So David, can you tell us what you see as the current situation regarding employees who are going to be returning to their desks? So there are a huge number of steps and interventions that employers are taking um, to make sure that people returning to work are safe and are comfortable that they are doing so. The second thing to note, however, which is equally as important, is that this is not just about going back to work. It's about trying to work out whether uh, there is a better way of working going forwards. And that's really the crux of where the debate has now got to. It's not will we all go back and work in the same way that we were before. So if the return to work means finding a new working pattern, what could that look like? And are companies ready? Firstly, a lot of listening will be going on where employers are fundamentally seeking to understand from their employees what they have lost 
by working at home and what they could gain from going back to the office. So listening to understand preferences and and changes as a and learnings from working on a hybrid basis. Ellis says some employees need to work in the office while others have responsibilities at home and perhaps the focus on the office as the hub and remote working as secondary needs to change. An employer is not going to, in the way that it would have done before, run a meeting in the office with 12 people in a meeting room and three people dialing in. You actually need to flip it on its head. How do I plan my meeting remotely that everyone can constructively contribute to even though some people may be in the office. If you've got employees uh, working in the office, your employees working at home, and yet some will not go into the office so much as maybe others, is the pay structure uh, an issue? It could well be. Um, so I think that we have a few things to wrestle with here. The, the first thing is, is that there are arguments out there that say working at home is cheaper than working in an office. I don't have to commute. I don't have to buy lunch in the same way and so on and so forth. And does that warrant a pay cut? Uh, the second thing to say is that if people are genuinely working from different locations that are physically quite far away from where the office was, we may see some disconnects in cost of living in various jurisdictions or various parts of the country meaning that people will be pushing to be paid more or less as a consequence. Ellis advises workers to firstly speak honestly with their employer about their situation. The second thing is, is that the health and safety position is paramount. So if you have any concerns from that perspective, you are absolutely within your rights to raise them and indeed should do so. He says the pandemic has created a huge catalyst for employers to play a significant role in managing the well-being of their workforce, be it mental or physical. Going forward, he sees flexible office space designed for collaboration rather than designed to house employees sitting at desks. And so we will comfortably reach a place where uh, we're not going in to sit at a desk and do things that we could do at home. We are going to a place to gain those interactions and, and engagement opportunities which we know make work. And that's the important sentence, I think. Certain things you cannot do at home on a screen. Ellis says for those just starting work for the first time, the office environment is important to understand what professional working looks like. If there was one thing I would say is fundamentally not worked, it's, it's new people starting work um, who had no experience of work before. Uh, that is really difficult to do remotely. Neil Woodrow, NTD News. The US Embassy in Berlin is investigating mysterious symptoms among its staff. The Havana syndrome is a neurological sickness that hits US Embassy workers in Cuba and elsewhere. NTD Zediaken has more on this. U.S. diplomats told the Wall Street Journal at least two U.S. officials based in Germany sought medical treatment after developing symptoms of the mysterious Havana syndrome. The syndrome includes symptoms such as dizziness, nausea, migraines and memory lapses. It was first reported in 2016 by U.S. officials based in the U.S. Embassy in Cuba. Besides Germany, it has been registered in other European nations, including Austria. In July, CIA director William Burns said, there's a very strong possibility that the syndrome is intentionally caused and that Russia could be responsible. The journal reported some victims were working on Russia-related issues. Moscow denies involvement. A US committee of medical and scientific experts concluded that the most likely cause was directed microwave energy. One patient treated for the syndrome told the journal, whatever it is, it is a form of terrorism. It has caused serious injuries that have been life-altering for some of us. A cybersecurity expert told NTD in May he thinks the syndrome is absolutely the result of a deliberate attack. It's an experiment on human subjects to hit somebody in the brain with that level of ultrasound, damage their ears, potentially cause brain damage. Uh, it's, it's an absolute bioweapon at attack that needs to be regulated, stopped, defended against. The CIA and the State Department are investigating. Eddie Aitken, NTD News.
Still to come, it's been a week since France enacted the new health pass law. We hear from Paris and rural Western France for two very different accounts of life under the new system. That and more after the break. Mandatory vaccination rollout for education staff in Latvia has prompted thousands to take to the streets in protest. Many believe it contravenes personal freedoms. Engineers Cost MS has more on this. Several thousand people gathered in the Latvian capital Riga on Wednesday. It comes as many opposed the rollout of mandatory vaccinations for education staff and other sectors. I am here for, for the freedom. Uh, I don't think it's normal what is happening now in our country and in uh, not just in our country, in all world. It's just um, it's unbelievable what's happening. And uh, I I will not go and do what they will ask. So I here for my kids. I have three of them and I will not dis uh, I don't give them this poison vaccine and for myself as well. They can't uh, put to us this big pressure and do not give us a choice for a freedom. I am here because uh, I'm uh, low my country and uh, I'm really I feel sad about this uh, situation, what's happening here, and uh, about, uh, about this injection. And uh, I actually think uh, for people uh, just uh, should give uh, that uh, choice, free choice, not uh, some, somebody is, 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 is telling you what you do. Because I think this is my body and that is my choice, what I'm doing with my, uh, my body. Up to 3,500 people participated in the protest. Police said that most protesters did not wear face masks or observe social distancing rules. Similar protests have been held in countries across Europe in recent weeks, including France, Italy and Lithuania. Costa Menes, NTD News. On 15th of October, French health workers who are not fully vaccinated will be suspended without pay. We hear from a professional who is resisting the vaccine despite her job being at risk. And today's John Robson brings us this report. Diane Hecking is a psychologist at a hospital in Paris. She has marched in three protests against the health pass since July. I will not get vaccinated because my employer or the government wants it. I think I still have this right. Hecking says she has no confidence in vaccines. She feels mask wearing and social distancing are sufficient. I am especially against the health pass because for me it's not normal that we should have to require to show an authorization to work or to go somewhere. All French health workers must be fully vaccinated by October the 15th or they will be suspended without pay. Hecking says in her work unit, six people are holding out against vaccination out of 30 staff. It's not reasonable and it will create discrimination and that can't be possible. I already see it happening at the hospital wing where I work. Hecking's boyfriend is a psychologist at the same hospital. He says he voted for Emmanuel Macron twice, but for the election next year, he will support Macron's rival. I was very enthusiastic when he was elected, and I feel betrayed. I didn't expect him to make decisions that are so authoritarian. The couple just bought a flat and have a mortgage to pay, but Hecking says she would rather lose her job than have the jab. Maybe there are things that would change. I have other options. I tell myself that in life we can bounce back, we can innovate, we can think of other means to earn a living, to pay back loans. The French government estimates 70% of health workers are fully vaccinated. Joanne Robson, NTD News. 
Still in Paris, it's a week since France required people to show a health pass to use basic services. Some are happy that health is being given such a priority, while others say their freedoms are being violated. Here's more from Joanne Robson. Police patrol Paris restaurants checking diners' health passes. After a week of police leniency, the government vowed to get tougher on the checks. Diners show their passes during a lunchtime police check. This man had his second dose of a COVID-19 vaccine last Saturday. Well, there's no choice. Here's the proof that we cannot escape it, so we need to get the pass. I took a test one hour ago. I was checked by the police. Everything's fine. So I just get on with my day. But he says he's not keen on the patrols. It's the checks, the act of taking out a document and an ID. I have a feeling that it's a bit more an invasion of privacy for me. It goes a bit too far. A retired hospital worker is in favour of the measures. I am for the vaccine, for the health pass, for health first. Doubt should have been banished a long time ago. I am more than convinced and I hope to convince as many people as possible. As well as checking passes, police are looking for fakes. We are seeing that people are responsible and are performing their civic duty. There are very few fines given out, and for all that, we are in a harsh phase and rule breakers will be fined. Since August the 9th, citizens have been required to show the pass in public places. It's sparked weekly protests against President Emmanuel Macron's legislation. Joanne Robson, NTD News. In the French countryside, one cafe owner is dealing with the health pass somewhat differently. And today's Joy Duguid brings us the details. In a rural corner in western France, cafe owner Denis Corsol is refusing to check the health pass of his customers. This act of rebellion risks the shutdown of his business and even jail. Corsol says he's not against the vaccine. He and his employees received their jabs. My problem is not the health pass. My problem is being asked to check for it. It's not our job. It's not our work ethic. Café and bar owners caught flouting the rule first face a warning, then a seven-day closure on second offence. Two more incidents could lead to a year in jail. I'm taking the risk that my business gets shut down by administrative closure. We talked about it with my employees, with the association who does the cultural events. And we all agree that if ever police come and ask us to check our customers for the health pass, we will close our establishment. Corsell says the police have not been since the law took effect and that customers react positively to his choice. It's a democratic gesture not to discriminate between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. It's like a little oasis. It's nice to not have to show our health pass. I don't have it anyway yet. It's sad because before, it was normal to go into a bar when we want. It's been a long time since I've experienced that. Even when I've had two vaccine doses, if I do, I don't wish to have a health pass. So it's good to have some places where there are no second-class citizens, where we can all live together. For me, it's important. I don't like seeing this take place. France has imposed the strictest health pass rules in Europe. Joy Duguid, NTD News. And finally, a Belgian-British teenager hopes to be the youngest woman to fly the world solo. Zara Rutherford took off from Belgium yesterday on a journey expected to last three months. And today's Aiken has the story. A British-Belgian teenager took to the skies on Wednesday in her quest to become the youngest woman to fly the world solo. 19-year-old Zara Rutherford took off from West Belgium in gusty overall conditions. I'm very nervous, I think. I'm also a bit in disbelief. I struggle to really realize I'm leaving in an hour. I think my next step is to just check the weather again. I'm not sure if I'll reach, so normally I'm reaching Scotland tonight. I'm not sure if that will work, but I'll try my best. Well, staying safe, of course. 
Rutherford hail from a family of pilots who offer a helping hand. She's been travelling in small planes since the age of six and began jumping out of them with a parachute aged 11. She started flying at 14 and has logged 130 solo hours. Rutherford's been preparing for the isolation of the trip. I, won't, I, won't, I, won't, I don't have to work out on the plane, but I will definitely not be doing much physical activity. And maybe fatigue might also play a role, so I have to be careful with that. And mentally, apparently loneliness can be quite a big thing for people who've told me what it's like to fly these long, long trips. So these are things I'm keeping in mind, and I'll also be on the phone with my parents often, and just friends and family. Rutherford aims to fly her fast, light aircraft over five continents and 52 countries in an aerial trek that could take three months. The plane is too small to fly over the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, so Rutherford will fly up through Europe and over Greenland. She'll head down through the United States, then back up to Alaska to cross the Pacific. From there, she'll head across Asia back to Europe. She says she wants to inspire young women to get into aviation. Rutherford hopes to show others that the sky's the limit when it comes to flying. Eddie Aiken, NTD News. That's the news for today, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Stuart Lees. Thank you for watching our daily news show on YouTube. You can also watch our other programming on Channel 190 on Sky TV or on Freeview via Channel Box on Channel 271. In the meantime though, please give this video a like and hit subscribe to our channel. Have a good day.